wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God, who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. Your brothers and sisters who are in Christ Jesus, our rock and our redeemer. Are mirrors a good thing or a bad thing? Not a trick question. You look at them every day, right? Are mirrors a blessing or a curse? Are they a good thing, a good aspect of your life, or are they a detriment and bad for you? I recently looked up a survey that gave their best guess on how many times you are, and I are going to look at a mirror throughout our lives. The best guess that they could throw out there was 281,000 times. I believe that averaged out to about 8 to 10 times a day, and if you lived to be about 70 years old. You know why it was difficult for them to come up with that number? Because some people look in the mirror maybe 2 to 3 times a day. Some people answered maybe 8 to 10, maybe 12 to 13. Some of the highest numbers that the surveyors came up with and admitted that they looked into the mirror was 80 to 90 times a day. The question I had response to that was, how would you have any time to do anything else if you were just staring in the mirror over and over again? But then I was reminded the reality is this, that every single one of us, many times over throughout the day, looks in the mirror. Why? Why is that one of the first places you go immediately after you wake up? If you're stopping to brush your teeth, give yourself a shave, fix up your hair. You want to look right, right? You want to look good. What does a mirror do? A mirror points out the imperfections. A mirror points out the ugly. It points out your flaws. It points out things that need to be fixed. It points out the problems. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? It's a tough thing, right? Some of those things we don't want to see, but it's a good thing because then we can fix them, right? You want to see if there's that hair sticking out of your nose that needs to be trimmed. You want to see that big old junk, uh, gunk of junk in your teeth so you can take it out before you go out in front of people. You want to see if you're having a bad hair day so you can do your best to not have a bad hair day. In the end, I think we can agree that mirrors are a good thing. Mirrors are a blessing. We all have them, right? What about the mirror of the law? Right, The three uses of the law, right? Curb, mirror, and guide. We go through that in Bible basis, go through that in confirmation. Why have we as Christians attributed a characteristic of the law as a mirror? What is the reflection that the law shows us? Is it a good picture or is it an ugly picture? If we're honest with ourselves, it's not an image that we want to see because it doesn't highlight some of the imperfections about us. When it comes to our life, our spiritual life, not exactly our physical life, it shows all of our flaws. It doesn't show that your eyeliner's off or your lipstick isn't on just right. It shows how you and I have failed to measure up to the glory of God. The reality is this, the mirror of the law is a tough thing. It's a tough pill for us to swallow. But does that make it a bad thing? Does that make it a curse? No. It's a blessing. Because it sounds the alarm. It's a reminder of the reality that you and I need a Savior. That we don't have it all together. That when it comes to the law of God, we can't fulfill it perfectly. Not for our lifetime, not for a single day. It shows us those imperfections. Why? So that they can be taken care of. So that God can rescue us from them. God is going to use his scriptures and he's going to use his law many times over through the season of Lent as a mirror to show you and to show me the ugliness of our spiritual nature. And don't think he does it because he hates you. He hates our sinful nature. He hates our sin but he brings it up before us because he loves us, because he overcomes those things, because he wants to defeat those bad things in our lives that we can't take care of on our own. The reality is this, the law is a mirror that stares us dead in the face. And when we're honest with ourselves, and when the Spirit moves us by faith to have the law do exactly what it was meant to do, the conclusion is this, I am a sinner who needs to be saved, but not the Pharisee. 
Not the Pharisee in our parable tonight, is, did he? When he looked at God's law, the last thing he said is, I'm a failure, is I have problems, is I have sins that need to be taken care of. No, he saw himself, and with this foolish, sinful, self-righteous pride, he was puffed up with his ego and left saying, I am amazing. And Jesus had a problem with that, because it's a lie. It's a lie of the devil. Our God wants to give us confidence, but not confidence in ourselves. Notice the theme of this uh, parable, right? An earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Jesus has a target audience here. Notice who he directs it towards. To some who were confident. Confident of what? Of their own righteousness. And looked down on everyone else, Jesus said. Jesus is directing this parable to people who think that righteousness is something that they can produce. They are the subject of it. When it comes to my righteousness before God, it's something I need to merit or earn or attribute myself and lay it as his feet as a blessing that I give to him. That was the Pharisee, right? It was all over, riddled all over his actions. We could see his heart bursting out of the seams, showing just how prideful it was. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers and evildoers and adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all that I get. The Pharisee took time looking at the law, looking at the commandments of God. And what did he conclude? Not only have I followed the commandment of love and to love others and to love God and the Ten Commandments, all of the other laws that the Pharisees and the religious rulers have come up with, I have done such a fantastic job that no one else deserves to even stand in my presence. I'll stand alone. And I will tell God just how great I am. Do you notice how he flipped the script on prayer? Remember what prayer is. Through the scriptures, through the word, God speaks to us. And the other side of that conversation is prayer, how God has opened the floodgates with his love for us to speak to him. The multiple opportunities for prayer that we have, prayers of thanksgiving, thanking our God for how great he is and the wondrous things he has done for us. Requests and supplications and and all these opportunities for us to go before God. The Pharisee wasn't praying that day. The Pharisee was lecturing God on how great he was. God, you are so lucky to have me in your kingdom. You are so lucky to call me your own. He was so confident of his righteousness because of the things that he had done. If anyone was going to be saved on this earth, it was most certainly him. Because he was looking at the things that he had done and convinced himself of a lie. A great reminder for all of us. There's a reason that we say 1 John every single Sunday in our liturgy. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive whom? Not God. We're only deceiving ourselves. The Pharisee had convinced himself that he had actually carried out the law. There's a mental disorder, there's a mental dysphoria that has a title called self-enhancement. I have concluded that it is the opposite of a caricature. You guys and gals know what a caricature is, right? Many people make their living on Las Vegas Strip or or different boulevards and avenues and roads drawing paintings that highlight what? The ugly. So if you have a a somewhat slightly jagged nose, they're going to make that thing as crooked as can be. If your ears are a little bit too big, they're going to give you elephant ears large as they can possibly imagine. If your teeth aren't all that straight, they'll make them as crooked as you can imagine, as snaggle-toothed as can be. They'll highlight the ugly. And I don't care how many of these videos you see or if you see them in person, when they hand the picture to the people, they'll smile and they'll laugh. But you can see a little bit of the pain in their eyes because a caricature highlights the truth, but it just highlights the ugly truth. Self-enhancement is the opposite of that. 
Self-enhancement is putting the ugly to the side and fooling ourselves by highlighting the good. So if our nose is all jagged, we straighten it out. If our ears are too big, we shrink them down to size. If our teeth are all messed up, they're as straight as straight can be. Was the Pharisee actually righteous at all on his own? No. Was there a single commandment that he had fulfilled perfectly? Not for a single day of his life. But the devil had convinced him otherwise. How? Not so much because the Pharisee looked at his own life. Notice where he was looking. Lord God, thank you that I am not like whom? That I am not like these other people. That I'm not like that tax collector in back. Yeah, he should have his head down in disgust because he has not been as good as I have been. He was lying to himself. And before you and I say shame on this Pharisee, the reality is this. You and I do this all the time. You and I find false comfort in the failures of others. Your sinful nature is going to try and do it this entire season of Lent. Every time I read this parable, I do it. Because I say to myself, Lord, I thank you that I'm not like the Pharisee, and I'm falling into the same trap that he did. And you might be thinking the same. Pastor, I've never stood up in the middle of service and lectured you on how great I am. No, you haven't, but that doesn't mean you don't struggle with that sin. Because if you're like me, as you read through the passion history, your knee-jerk reaction is, how dare they? How could they be so sinful? Peter, denying him not just once, but three times, and cursing his name? You were one of his greatest disciples. Thomas, how could you doubt? Judas, how could you betray to the Jewish people? How could you put him to death and release Barabbas, a convicted criminal? How could they, how dare they? And then the law does what it should, and it brings that mirror back to me and says, Jordan, and you, you are the man. You're just as sinful as everybody else. I'm sure you've heard that joke before, right? When I get to the pearly gates, as long as there's a murder in front of me and a murder behind me, then I'm going to be good. Because what are you thinking? If I'm fresh off the heels of that guy or that gal, then the things that I have done aren't going to look all that bad. I mean, think about it. You might believe that at the courthouse, right? If you go in for parking tickets, you might want to be behind the triple homicide because a couple parking tickets don't look all that bad. But there's one flaw in that false comfort. When you go before your God on that day of judgment, when it's you and him one-on-one, -on -one, He's not going to be looking at anyone else. And if you try to point his gaze at someone else that you think is worse than you, Lord, I know I haven't fulfilled your law perfectly, but have you seen Hitler? Have you seen others? Have you seen the molesters and the murderers? Have you seen the drug dealers? Have you seen the horrible, terrible people in this world? Their sin is a whole lot more severe than mine. That's no comfort at all because it's not true. There's a motto that I live my life by, one of the quotes that I live my life by, it's this, if you try to find joy in the sadness of others, you're never going to find it. But maybe we could tweak that for our purposes tonight. If you try to find your salvation in the sins of others, you're never going to find it. If that's where your comfort is found based on your salvation, that someone else has done worse than you, then you're doing it all wrong then your righteousness is your righteousness. And Isaiah reminds us that even our righteous, ag, our righteous rags, our righteous acts are sin-riddled rags. So instead, your Lord calls for you and for me to look away from ourselves, to put that law down, to put that mirror that gazes at ourself away and look elsewhere. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. The tax collector got it. The tax collector looked at the Ten Commandments and said, no way. I don't know exactly what he was thinking about in the temple, but I'm sure it's the same thing that I think about 
every single time I come in to worship our Lord. I'm sure for him it was personal. He was thinking about how many times he's backstabbed and betrayed people that he knew. He's thinking of all the times he ripped people off to make his living. He's thinking of all the times that he stole and lied right directly to people's face. And he looked at the law and the mirror and the imperfections and failures that he has done. And he was led to one conclusion. I'm a sinner. But dear brothers and sisters in Christ, it doesn't stop there. Because the words of our Savior step in. It brings us back to the Pharisees standing outside of the house of Matthew, the tax collector, when he was called. And Jesus is sitting down at his table. And what are the Pharisees doing? Snickering and sneering. Saying to the disciples, you need to talk to this guy. Because he's sitting down and eating with sinners. And what does Jesus say? It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. When the law does its work, you and me, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, say, I'm a sinner. And Jesus said, that's exactly why I came. He reminds us every day, I didn't come for the perfect I came to make you perfect. I came to be perfect for you so that I could give it to you. The will of our God is this, as he just said, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. I don't want my relationship with you based on the things that you have done or you could do because it would never be good. It would never be right. It instead has to be based solely on mercy, solely on the things that my son would do for you. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, every day of Lent, every day of life, after the law, the mirror of the law does its job, after you have come to that conclusion that I am a sinner that have not been righteous on my own, set that mirror down. Because it's time to pick up the mirror of the gospel. The mirror of the good news of Jesus Christ. You pick that mirror up and you're as equally amazed, if not more, as you were the law. You look at that mirror and you don't see yourself anymore. It's reflected away from you. And you see someone living life perfectly. Not just loving others, not just loving God, but fulfilling the Ten Commandments. Every single one of them. Being patient and gentle and kind and loving and selfless. It's not you. It's Jesus. But it's credited to you as if you did it. And then you turn that mirror a little bit again and you see an old rugged cross covered and basted in blood. You see a crown of thorns. You see persecution and pain and punishment. You're not doing it, but it has your name on it as if you did. And then you turn that mirror again and you look past that and you see an empty tomb. And you see victory over sin, death, and the devil And you see righteousness and holiness and perfection. And it wasn't yours, but as it were given to you by Jesus, as if you did it, just as if it was your victory. That's the vicarious atonement, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ. You'll notice the change of scenery on the altar tonight. Put black. What does that signify? A period of mourning, right? common faux pas to wear black to a wedding, a day of celebration. Not supposed to do that. But on a funeral, a day of death, a day of mourning, that's what you're called to wear. The reminder is this. Tonight we mourn. Every day as Christians we mourn our sin and just how severe it is. We mourn the fact that we should not just die in this life but forever. We mourn the fact that hell should be our home. But it doesn't stop there because we rejoice. No, we rejoice that sin and death and the devil himself have been defeated. We rejoice that Jesus defeated death by dying. We rejoice that hell will never be our home, that instead heaven is our eternal resting place. We rejoice that Jesus has lived the life that I was called to live and that you were called to live. He died the death that had my name on it and yours too. 
and that guarantees that the things that we could never earn or deserve will absolutely be ours. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, remember what mercy is. Grace is God giving to us the things that we don't deserve. God's love moving him to shower down upon us blessings that we have not credited or earned ourselves. Mercy is this, God not giving us the things that we do deserve. God not punishing us. God not persecuting us. Instead, he did that to his one and only son. He said, you and I would never be punished. He said, you and I would never die eternally. He said, you and I would never know what it's like for the father to turn his back on us. Because we only know his son. Ash Wednesday, Ash Wednesday is a, a day of mourning, but so is every day as a Christian. It starts there, but it doesn't end there. This season of Lent, your Savior calls you to take a serious look at your sin and what it meant and what it would mean for your Savior. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, be reminded that Jesus had to die because there are sinners in this world, that their sins needed to be paid for. But Jesus had to die because you've sinned. And because I have sinned. But the most beautiful reminder is this, on this Valentine's Day of love, that there's no greater love than the love of Jesus. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst, and of whom you are the worst, so that he could credit his righteousness, his perfection, to you and to me. On this Ash Wednesday, and forevermore, we mourn so much more than that we rejoice. In Jesus Christ, our Savior, this day and always.